Last weekend, if you were at one of the masses that I celebrated, you hopefully will remember that I used the image of the cross and said we have to respect both arms of the cross, the vertical and the horizontal. The horizontal being our service of one another and the vertical, our ascent to God. And we said that both of them were important. And I talked about how some people in their desire to help others on the horizontal, seeing their problems in their life and the pain that they're enduring, the difficulties and all that, want to help them, which is fine, but they'll do so sometimes at the expense of the vertical, of the call to holiness, and they'll start telling them that certain things that the church has taught us are sinful and do not draw us into union with God, for them are okay because it would be too difficult for them to live without it. And so they start encouraging them to live in situations that are sinful, which maybe make their horizontal life, their life in this earth easier, but compromise or sacrifice the call to holiness. So last week we looked at those who worry about the horizontal and forget the vertical. This week in the gospel reading we see the opposite. We see people who worried about the vertical adoration of God without the horizontal, without proper care for other people. And we see that in the Pharisees and the scribes and their response to Jesus today. When he notices that Jesus and his disciples do not follow the ceremonial washing of hands beforehand, and they question him about it. And they're not questioning him in a desire to understand, they're doing it in a snide way. What's wrong with you people? Why don't you follow the tradition of the elders? How dare you not wash your hands? That's basically the approach that they were giving him. And so Jesus talks about the hypocrisy that was there. And the hypocrisy, he says, is that you worried about the human uh, doctrines and the things that you do, but you forget about the divine law. You forget about living holy lives. You worry about anything that goes into a person to make him unclean, which is one of the reasons why they wash their hands and jugs and cups so carefully to make sure they didn't get any you know, you know, external disease or anything like that that would come into it, he goes, which is fine, but you completely ignore the things that come out of a person, which really defile them, the envy, the deceit, the, you know, all the different things, the blasphemy, the arrogance that Jesus talks about. He says, you don't worry about those. You only worry about the person washing his hands properly. And so he's not saying that the human level, all of those rules are wrong, but that they honor all the wrong ones. They obey the letter of the law and they abandon, abandon the heart of it. So basically, they could be saying somebody could be arrogant, a murderer, a thief, and that's okay. You know, there's no problem with that. Just make sure you wash your hands properly before you eat. You know, that was the most important thing to them. And of course, Jesus calls them out on it. And, and I think we all can see right through that, how the more important things are the moral things, the things we do in our lives are the things that God wants us to worry about. And how did they get that way? Well, in order to understand, we need a little history lesson. Once the Israelites came into the promised land under Joshua, the land that Moses led them to after they left Egypt, they had to struggle for several hundred years to try to get control of the land, fighting the Philistines and many other people, the people that were living there before them. And finally, under King David, David defeated all of their enemies and secured their borders, and now Israel was a safe haven. And they built, you know, when Solomon built the temple, they took the Ark of the Covenant, which had the stone tablets with the commandments on them, into it. And they kind of got the idea that this was safe base, kind of like children playing a game of tag, that whatever you've determined is the safe zone, you know, the, the, the base, you can stand with your, even just your toe touching the base, and you can go out and do anything, but nobody can tag you because you're on safe base. You can't be it with that. And they got that mentality. They could do whatever they wanted as long as they were there in the land, because it was the land that made them holy. Except that they did that and completely ignored the Lord and following all the commandments, all the things they were supposed to do, including even going so far as to worship pagan gods. And they set up altars to Baal and Ashtaroth and Dagon and so many of the other pagan gods of that time and were not worshiping the Lord, only giving him lip service, saying their morning prayers, for example, to him. But then the rest of the time they were following these foreign gods and they were not caring for one another. They were not taking care of the poor and the widow, the orphan, like they were supposed to. And God sent them prophet after prophet to tell them, to warn them, say, hey, look what you're doing wrong here. 
And what did they do? Most of the prophets they killed. They just did not want to hear that they were doing anything wrong. So finally, God had to really play hardball with them. And in 586 BC, the Babylonians came in, destroyed Jerusalem, they leveled the temple that Solomon had built, and the the Ark of the Covenant with the Ten Commandments was lost to history. If it still exists to this day, nobody knows where it is. And they were taken far away to Babylon, where they sat there for 70 years in the Babylonian captivity. And they sat there almost with their mouths hanging open, basically saying, I can't believe it. God let Jerusalem be destroyed. He destroyed his own house, the place where his word dwelt. How could he do that? And it took them a while to realize that the important thing was not the stone tablets upon which the law was, were written, but the laws themselves that were written on the tablets. It was obedience to the law that made them holy, not being in the physical presence of the Ark of the Covenant. And so during their time there, they discovered they could follow God and be his people even in a foreign land. And thankfully, during that time, they learned their lesson. They changed their ways. They got rid of the foreign gods, and they finally never again went near them. And 70 years later, when they went back, they eventually rebuilt the temple and rebuilt their country again. But they remembered the lesson that they had learned, that obedience to God's law is what makes us holy. And of course, that's a good thing. But in their obsession with the Lord, with the word of the Lord and his law, they worried about so many other things. Well, what happens if you're in a situation where it's difficult to follow God's law? And the rabbis would sit together hour after hour after hour, posing all sorts of different questions. Well, the Lord's, you know, the law says this, but suppose this happens and it makes it hard for that person. Is there an exception? Or what happens when it's not possible? And they'd go back and forth throwing out every sort of possible situation or scenario you could imagine. How would you follow God in these moments? And to preserve the law, to make sure that they didn't even remotely come close to disobeying God's law, they wrote their own laws around it to keep people even very far from doing something sinful. For example, uh, the, the law allowed a criminal to receive 40 lashes under the whip. But they thought, well, what would have happened if somebody miscounted? and they accidentally gave somebody 41 lashes, well, then you would have sinned. You'd have gone beyond the law. So they passed a law that you can give only 39 lashes so that if you miscounted, you probably wouldn't do it twice, and so you still wouldn't have sinned by giving a 41st strike to the person. And so many other things to worry about, the kosher laws and the, uh, the purity and the purifications. They had all the things that we're hearing talk about today, the proper way to wash your hands, the proper way to wash a cup and a jug and food when it comes back, even washing their beds and cleansing them beforehand. And Jesus would say they overdid it because they were so worried about that and they forgot the law behind it. And it seemed they got down to just as long as you obey those external things, then you were holy. And they kind of sort of set themselves up as their own little Gestapo. They became watchdogs, looking for everybody just to make sure that people followed all those exterior laws. And you can almost see them doing it. You're following around people, watching, trying to catch them doing something wrong. In fact, we see it in the case where they come up to Jesus and the apostles where they're picking off grains of wheat on the Sabbath and eating them. Now, Jesus and the apostles are in the middle of the field. The Pharisees going after them, following them everywhere just to find something. What were they doing in the middle of the field with Jesus and the apostles? But obviously they were doing that. And they would sit and watch. And they made themselves the judges of everybody else. And they were judge and jury. And if they caught somebody doing something wrong, it's wrong for you to do that. You can't do that. And they sat there just trying to find people doing things wrong. And again, people who were doing things wrong, great things, of course, it didn't seem, as Jesus says, they didn't mind if somebody was, you know, murderous or a thief or anything like that, but people who were living externally with obvious signs that they were disobeying God's law, such as the tax collectors and prostitutes, well, instead of going after them and trying to call them away from their sin and back to God, they sat in judgment of them and declared... Uh, declared them unclean, unholy, defiled people, and they just separated them and said, anybody who has anything to do with them is defiled. Just stay away from those sinners. And when Jesus came along, 
and went after the tax collectors and the prostitutes and tried to call them away from their sin. And yes, they were committing serious sin. There's no doubt about that. But when Jesus came to call them away from that and it was working, instead of rejoicing that sinners were leaving their sin behind and returning to God, they became indignant with Jesus. How dare he go and talk with people like that? And he was undefiled. He was now defiled, rather, because he went and ate with defiled people. And so they thought Jesus was impure now because he had contact with these people. So you see the danger that they had there. And that's why Jesus called them hypocrites, because they worried only about the exterior manifestations and not about the heart of the law. They obeyed the letter of the law but abandoned the heart of it. And you and I as Catholics can easily fall into the same trap because as Catholics we have many traditions, many customs, many things that we're meant to do, which are good, and there's a purpose there to guide us in holiness, to leading us to proper worship of God. For example, we're told when we come to church, and whenever we enter church, we should genuflect before the blessed sacrament. Whenever we pass the altar, we bow before it, making sure we give our proper sign of reverence of the bow of the head, extend our hands or our tongue appropriately for receiving communion, and all the other things that we know we're supposed to do, our morning prayers and everything else that we do. And we can be very easily caught up in just making sure that we do all those external things, which are not wrong in themselves, but sometimes we can forget the heart of it all and forget to live the moral upright life that the Lord is calling us to do. And sometimes even seeing other people and setting ourselves up as judges of others, just like the Pharisees did. People who become holier than thou, you know, they, to, they pride themselves on how holy they look. They come in, they do everything properly. They're the good Catholics. They do everything right. And all the other people out there, they're all the sinners. And they somehow feel that their job is to chastise and point out sinners. And every parish has them. The people that I'm sure you know, and you've seen them. You know, the people that come in and they're absolutely perfect in their bows and their genuflections, which is great. There's nothing wrong with that. But then it's as if they sit and they look at everybody else in the church, those already there and the ones coming in, and like with an eagle's eye, they watch and they stare and they sneer, looking to find someone doing something wrong, to look at every single person sitting there. And when they find one, aha, that person came into church and didn't genuflect. Or they'll point at all sorts of other things. Ah, that person is talking before Mass. Or you'd think that person would pick up the hymnal and actually even read the words of the hymn along rather than if they're not going to sing it. Would it hurt them to do that? Or some, you know, they'll comment on the people's clothing and say, look at the way that person came into Mass. Do you really, couldn't they show some respect for the Lord? After all, is that the best clothes they have to bring before the Lord in worship? Or they see a mother struggling with a child who's being a little difficult, maybe making some noise, and you know, the mother is trying to control the child, and they just look and go, oh, you know, like rather than trying to help the mother who's having a difficult time, maybe say or do something to say, hey, let me help you here, they just sit in judgment. They're perfect. You know, they're holier than thou. They do everything right, and everyone else does everything wrong. And don't we all know them? We all have people in our lives that we know are like that. They just sit in self-righteous judgment of other people. And that's the mistake that the Pharisees made that we want to make sure that we never make in our lives, judging other people. Sure, there are things that obviously we want people to genuflect and bow properly because that's our proper devotion to the Lord that leads us into holiness in Him. But there's a polite and charitable way to call them to do that rather than just chastising them or sitting in judgment of them. So finding the polite, convenient words to say, hey, you know, don't forget, remember we genuflect when we come in to show that Jesus is truly in the tabernacle. If you see somebody whose clothing is inappropriate and you feel that you're able to say something politely, don't you think it might be a little bit better to cover up a little bit more when you come to Mass? Something polite, something encouraging rather than chastising. Because when people see that, holier-than-thou people do not bring anybody to the Lord. They all, in fact, people who do that only come across as hypocrites. They show the Lord externally how much they claim they love Him by their proper worship, but they look down on everybody else. And that will not bring anyone to the Lord. And so our devotion to God, the vertical, cannot be at the expense of the horizontal of not showing love and care and concern for other people. Sometimes it can happen even in our ministries to others. 
You know, um, it could be, for example, somebody working in maybe a soup kitchen or something like that, or you know, giving out clothes to the poor or something. And they come in looking for you know food certificates, a gift, you know, a food basket from the poor, and they've got nice jewelry on or something like that. And people say, "Ha! Huh, look at that! They have plenty of money for that nice jewelry, and look at all those tattoos they have. Why don't they just sell that jewelry and start buying food instead? Don't you think they should do the first things first? Well. There may be a point there, but not to sit in judgment of people and maybe to encourage them and to say, you know, maybe you have your priorities messed up. Maybe food on the table is more important than the jewelry and your hairstyle and all those tattoos that you've got. If we feel we have a point to make to them, to do it charitably. Sometimes even our, in our defense of the faith and the, the, the moral things that we believe in, sometimes we can make mistakes. Uh, I remember, for example, a woman I worked with many years ago who was very big in the pro-life movement, and that was wonderful. She was always out there defending uh, the faith, not afraid to stand up and talk about respect you know, for, for the unborn you know, and trying to end abortion and all that, which in all of that was fine, but she was an angry woman, and it was in everything she did. Yet when she was arguing people on abortion, all she basically would do, you know, the basic line was anybody who was in favor of abortion, she just called them, you know, baby killers and you're all going to hell and all sorts of stuff like that. And language such as that doesn't help anyone and it doesn't change anybody's heart. But rather than trying to encourage people to understand why we defend life, and I tried to say to her once, I said, you know, our defense of life is great, but we cannot isolate only one level of life and only defend the unborn. Whereas talking about pro-life, we have to have a consistent pro-life ethic. That means we have respect for every single life, including those who are already born, and even those who disagree with us, even those who are fighting to keep abortion legal, even them, even they are human beings, that we must show respect for them. Sometimes maybe we have to use a strong argument, but certainly never in condemnation of them, because that's certainly never going to bring anyone back to the Lord and change a heart. Maybe sometimes the best we can do is just you know, silence opposition, and maybe we have a strong argument that will just the other person can't respond to, but always with charity and desire for the conversion of that person, that underneath we're praying for them and saying, Lord, do they not realize what they're doing? how much harm they're bringing in the world, even though they think they're helping other people. And then when there are people who are living in situations that we know are keeping them from the ascent to God, or well, any of the hot topic issues, for example, where we all have loved ones, friends, somebody who's followed one thing or another, and they're living in a situation, doing something, they've gone through something that we know is sinful and is not leading them to holiness in the Lord. How do we respond to them? The worst thing to do is to disown them, to just say, that's it, I've had it, you're out of my life, you know, I don't know you, I have no son, I have no daughter, whatever it may be, just get out of my life until you change. Please, that's the worst thing we could ever do for somebody. What do we do for somebody that is doing something that we know is sinful, we don't agree with? First of all, number one, always love them. Remind them, you are still my son, my daughter, my grandchild, my nephew, my niece, my friend, whatever it may be. I love you, and I'm never going to stop loving you, and I'm not throwing you out of my life. But I love you enough to tell you the truth that what you think you need to hold on to, what you need to practice, what you need to believe, is harming your relationship with the Lord. It's not drawing you into union with Him and the ascent to God. Rather, it's leading you away from it. And so I hope and pray that you will listen and realize that God has so many more graces and blessings and joys that He wants to give you that are far greater than the things you're holding on to that you think you need so much, but he can't fill your hands with them until you empty them, until you let go of all the things you're holding on to and allow God to fill you with them. And when you do that, then he will give you a grace and a joy and a happiness and a fulfillment that nothing sinful could ever bring you. And then say that to them and then drop the subject. And don't bring it up to them and nag them every time we see them or make it obviously difficult whenever we're there. And hopefully the day might come where maybe they've finally realized that all the th happiness they thought they were going to get by this activity or that lifestyle, whatever it may be, is not happening. And maybe they'll remember what you told them. And they might come back because you loved them and say, you know, maybe I should have listened to what you said. I realize now that you were right. And then they'll be open 
to you telling them what greater things God has for them, which will happen if we keep the lines of communication and the love open and always available, and will never happen if, like the Pharisees, we just disown people and call them sinners and just throw them out of our lives. And so, my brothers and sisters, the bottom line today is that the Lord is calling us to respect both arms of the cross. Yes, first and foremost, the horizontal, that all of us are being called in the ascent to God to try to become one with Him because that's what He did for us at our baptism as we receive Him in the Eucharist. We are physically becoming one with the body of the risen Christ who is God in the flesh, and He's drawing us into total union with Him. So that is the vertical of the cross. And then the same, the horizontal, reaching out to other people on several different levels. Number one, when we come to know the Lord, then naturally we want other people to know the Lord and do for them what he's done for us. And so we have compassion right away on people who are poor, who are ill, and we want to know what can I do for them and go out of our way to try to help other people. And that's the social mission that the church has always had for 2,000 years, going out and helping those who are in need, but doing that with an aim to bringing them to re recognize and understand the ascent to God even if they're not aware of it at the moment, even if they don't even know God, that through our generosity to them, that they will come to know the Lord and they'll see the difference he makes in our lives, the joy, the happiness he brings us, and they too will desire to want to make that ascent to God and go out and then help other people by obeying or respecting the horizontal of the cross, of helping other people and bringing everyone together together into the vertical of our adoration of God and realizing that we're all being called into union with Him. Our service to one another and our adoration of God, neither one can work without the other, but may we have both of them together and each and every day strive to do that so that we will truly be the disciples that Jesus has called us to be. May Jesus Christ be praised now and forever.